Our magnetic fields have been stable for millennia. But sometime around 1900, things began to change. And the acceleration of that change has happened over the last few years. An exponential decrease in the strength of our magnetosphere. Now at the same time, like I said, around 1900, the poles rapidly began to move. These are the magnetic poles, not the rotational pole. That is stationary. But the magnetic poles control weather on Earth. And they also control where space weather affects Earth. So we've seen lots of changes in space weather over just the last decade. In fact, we've seen new aurora, white, yellow, and even Steve descending on North America. And just this last weekend, Steve descended once again to North America. And it wasn't a surprise solar storm, but it might be a surprise to the mainstream solar scientists because this storm happened simply because of a coronal hole stream, which are naturally occurring on our sun almost all of the time. Now, more importantly, a new paper coming out unraveling the mysteries of gigantic jet lightning bursts that reach 50 miles into space, well, have many people's eyebrows raised. Take a look at that. Now, lightning from thunderstorms doesn't just strike the ground, as you can see here. Sometimes it goes up forming a rarely seen type of electrical discharge known as a gigantic jet. Some call them sprites. But these jets connect the top of the clouds to the lower edge of space. Observations of a single one of these gigantic jets has challenged some of the expectations about this phenomenon but has also provided a better understanding of how these transient luminous events form. So just to reiterate, these gigantic jet lightning bolts to space, they're referred to as transient luminous events, or TLEs. Now, as reported in Science Advances, this paper coming out this week. A team was able to study one of these jets in three dimensions based on a combination of satellite data, radio waves, and radar. But the starting point of the investigation was a group of photographs taken by a citizen scientist of one of these jets in Oklahoma. And thank God for citizen scientists. Let's just blow this up for you. Now, Kevin Palavec is the photographer. He had a low-light camera in Central Texas that sometimes randomly operates. And he had captured a couple of years ago, according to lead author Levi Boggs from Georgia Tech, this picture, or group of pictures, and it was kind of just sitting around. And then the lead author was told about it and decided to investigate it a bit. Now the jet that you're looking at here from the picture started from an area on the cloud top that measured around 50 by 50 kilometers or 31 by 31 miles, however you want to look at it. And that's the glowing area. And at about 15 to 20 kilometers altitude, it then sparked upwards, and here you can see the progression from the beginning of the discharge on the left and the glow at the top of the cloud tops to the beginning of the streamer to the full discharge and then the retraction.
Now, the beginning of the transient luminous event began at about 20 kilometers altitude, and then it sparked upwards, reaching the ionosphere, the portion of our planet's atmosphere that extends from 48 kilometers or 30 miles above the surface to the edge of space, which is about 600 miles up. This event transferred an enormous amount of charge between the cloud and the ionosphere, obviously resulting, well, the Schumann re resonance was off the charts because Schumann resonance is nothing more than the detection of ionospheric lightning. And I hate to say it. It does affect some people, but it has nothing to do with your soul. The Schumann resonance is a measure of the amount of ionospheric lightning at the ionospheric space boundary. And when we have gigantic jets or luminous events like this, we have a spike in the Schumann. Now the event, as I said, transferred an enormous amount of charge between the cloud and the ionosphere. Now regular lightning has a very broad range, but the gigantic jet in Oklahoma in fact delivered three times the maximum energy you can get from lightning. And that's a trifecta. This gigantic jet was also Extremely peculiar because it happened in a thunderstorm over land instead of sea where most of these jets commonly occur. And this may be a hint of to things to come, perhaps. Now, interesting caveat here, the storm where this gigantic jet was formed seemed to be lacking in lightning striking downwards towards the ground. And that's similar to storms over the ocean, which also produce these jets. And this could lead to an accumulation of charge in the cloud top that creates the perfect conditions for gigantic jets. But we're just speculating at this point. Now, the team of scientists is not speculating. They're doing good science. And Steve Kummer, a, profession, a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Duke, he uses electromagnetic waves that lightning emits to study the powerful phenomenon of luminous events or gigantic jets. And he's operating a research site where sensors resembling conventional antennas are arrayed in an otherwise empty field, waiting to pick up signals from locally occurring storms. Now, the VHF and optical signals definitively confirmed what researchers have suspected, but not yet proven, that the VHF radio from lightning is emitted by small structures called streamers. And you can see a streamer here. And they are at the very tip of the developing lightning. While the strongest electric current flows significantly behind this tip in an electrically conducting channel called a leader. But the streamer is everything. Now, Doug Mack, co-author of the paper at the University Space Research Association, said the study was unique in determining that the 3D locations for the lightning's optical emissions were well above the cloud tops. And that's pretty interesting. So this gigantic jet lightning is beginning to emerge above the clouds in the middle of nowhere and then connecting to space. And the fact that the gigantic jet was detected by several systems, including the lightning mapping array and two geostationary optical lightning instruments was unique. And it gives them a lot more information on these gigantic jets. Just take a look at this picture. It's absolutely mind-blowing. We're already miles up into the atmosphere, and this is exploding 
through the stratosphere into the ionosphere and then touching space up in these tentacles. Now, gigantic jets have been observed and studied over the past two decades. Hmm, I wonder why that is. However, because there's no specific observing system to look for them, detections have long been rare. But that's not true. I subscribe to a guy on Facebook who regularly captures these sprites and luminary events. Now, fortuitously, the event took place in a location with nearby VHF lightning mapping systems within range of the next generation weather radar or NEXRAD. And this made all of this data ever more palatable to be studied. And that's good news. But what's bad news is what's coming. Now, the data show that the discharge ascends from the cloud top and VHF radio sources were detected at altitudes of 22 to 45 kilometers, while optical emissions from the lightning leaders remained near the cloud top at an altitude of 15 to 20 kilometers. The simultaneous 3D radio and optical data indicate that VHF lightning networks detect emissions from streamer coronas rather than the leader channel, which has broad implications to lightning physics beyond that of gigantic jets. Now, why do the gigantic jets shoot charge into space? Well, because aliens need electricity too, duh. But on a more serious note, it's because there's a buildup of negative charge. And then we think that the conditions in the storm top weaken the uppermost charge layer, which is usually positive. In the absence of lightning discharges down to the surface, which we normally see, a gigantic jet may relieve the buildup of excess negative charge in the cloud simply up into space as a backdoor. Now, for now, there are many unanswered questions about the gigantic jets, which are part of a class of mysterious transient luminous events. And that's because observations of them are rare. It happened by chance, from pilots or aircraft passengers happening to see them or photographers waiting to capture them. Now, estimates for the frequency of gigantic jets range from 1,000 per year to up to 50,000 per year. And that's just how blind and stupid, lazy and distracted we are as humans and scientists on the surface. But the truth is that they're being reported more often, in fact, even in tropical regions. However, the Oklahoma gigantic jet, which was twice as powerful as the next strongest one, wasn't part of a tropical storm system at all. So there is that. Now, beyond their novelty, gigantic jets could have an impact on the operation of satellites in low Earth orbit, and as more of these space vehicles are launched, signal degradation and performance issues could become more significant. The gigantic jets could also affect technologies such as over-the-horizon radars that bounce radio waves off the ionosphere. And so, the problem is that the magnetosphere is waning. It's getting weaker, and it's allowing more radiation in. And here we're looking at the dipole moment, which is proof that the magnetic field has been rapidly dropping since about 1900. And, well, it's been exponentially dropping just in the last two decades. With a zero point sometime around 2035. That's a rapid drop-off. And that's not good news for plants or humans. Because the Earth's magnetic field is linked to extinctions. And there was no flipping 42,000 years ago. This is just a bad article. There's way better peer-reviewed papers. And we're going to share one here before we wrap up. You're looking at the Blake, the Iceland Basin, the Pringle Falls, 
the Portuguese Orphan, the Le Champ, and the Mono Lake excursions. These are all geomagnetic excursions, not polar flips, not geomagnetic polar reversals, just excursions. Departures in the dipole field, like we're seeing now, exponentially down. And when these occur, well, let's take the Le Champ for example, 42,000 years ago, bad things happen. Now, a paper just coming out this week is saying that plants also suffer, but some prosper. Some species of plants prosper in low magnetic fields, where others, well, they just don't do so good. So we have that to look forward to. And then there's other biological entities. There's lots of life on Earth, and they are all affected by the role of geomagnetic field intensity. And a paper here... The role of geomagnetic field intensity in late quaternary evolution of humans and large mammals proves that the extinction of Neanderthals occurred during low field intensity or a geomagnetic excursion, one that will peak in 15 years or so. Now, will we become extinct? It's anybody's guess. Dozens of other creatures became extinct as the field decreased, and then new species took their, their space. That's what happens during these events. We're not here to scare you. We're here to prepare you. So we're going to leave you links to the articles, everything we talked about, including the paper here, The Role of Geomagnetic Field Intensity in Late Quaternary Mammals. And it is very telling. It's, it's frightening what happens when the field intensity drops, the extinctions occur. Now, luckily, right after the extinction event, there are other species to take over. And that's good news. When Neanderthals ended at the first flux, Cro-Magnum emerged right here at the bump. Neanderthals went extinct and a new species emerged, Cro-Magnon. And then the last Neanderthal went extinct down here forever and ever and ever. So the Neanderthal species couldn't take the heat of increased UVA, UVB, and UVC, but Cro-Magnon could. And we're, thankfully, Cro-Magnon. My skin tans. And I've been going outside in UV index of 12, and I'm not dead yet. And that's a boom to knowledge. We're not here to scare you. We're here to prepare you. And as we descend deeper, we're going to see more aerial phenomenon. We're going to see more new aurora. We're going to see new catastrophic weather events. Increased lightning, increased hail, increased gigantic jets and luminary events. And it's all because of the sun. When the sun goes weak, the magnetosphere weakens as well. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Become a Patreon. We need you to do this work. Or if you can't afford it, just be a hero and share the video. We love you. Be safe.